We welcome you to another Sunday School lesson. Sunday School is a blessing and gift from God. Leaders of morality are not born, they are called by God. The repetitive, moral downward spiral during the time of the judges begins again. God turns them over to the Midianites, who invade every year with their allies from the east. These raids take Israelite crops and livestock. God's people cry out for help after seven years. The Lord first appoints a leader. Throughout scripture we see examples of God meeting with man, and countless lives being transformed as the result. A study of scripture shows that God's leaders were not those who desired high positions, but those whom God placed there. When we read about Gideon, we find a man who was reluctant to respond to God's call. He was not a born leader, and had no aspirations to be famous or to receive glory. He doubted that God could use him at all. Our lesson from Judges chapter 6 shows how God called Gideon to lead his people against the Midianites and nurtured his confidence to lead. May your hearts be also filled with a wholehearted desire to meeting God. Our first verse says, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. After Deborah and Barak defeated the Canaanites, Israel became free and lived in peace, because they were following the ways of the Lord. Then a new generation returns to worshipping Baal and the other false gods. The Lord responds to Israel's evil by allowing them to be oppressed again. This time, Israel's oppressor will be the Midianites. Midian was one of the sons of Abraham and a wife called Keturah, whom he married after the death of Sarah. The descendants of Midian grew to be a persistent people, often existing as nomads in the ancient Near East. Midian harassed the Israelites and tried to lead them away from God. Many years later, God allowed the Midianites to grow strong. They began to cross over to the western side and push farther into the land. The Lord gives Israel into their hands for seven years because of Israel's evil practices. Verse 2 says, Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves and strongholds. The Midianites were oppressive in their regular raids on Israel's crops and livestock. This would leave the Israelites poor, insecure and vulnerable to starvation. To avoid this, the people of Israel resort to hiding themselves and their food in the caves and strongholds of the mountains. Rather than taking over the land outright, Midian would let the people of Israel freely plant crops, only to steal them when they were harvested. Verses 3 to 6 are not part of our printed text, but those verses say the Midianites were accompanied by the Amalekites, a nomadic tribe like them. They even camped in the land and destroyed the crops that the Israelites had planted. They didn't leave anything for the Israelites to eat, they didn't even leave them any sheep, cattle, or donkeys. The Israelites became very poor because of the Midianites. Verse 7 says, When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Israelites were beaten down, fearful, humiliated, and ruined. It's likely some of the people were on the brink of starvation. They were crushed, and had lost the will to fight. They could not stand up to this overwhelming enemy. Finally, they cried out to the Lord for help instead of waiting for Baal and the other false gods to act on their behalf. When we are going through something or even experiencing God's discipline, we often waste time trying to work things out ourselves before we call on the Lord for help. If we seek God early in our situations, maybe he will answer sooner. Verse 8 says, He sent them a prophet, who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. We often find that God sends help in stages. In our human minds, we want to know why God does not send a clear answer all at once, with one sweep of his mighty hand. The answer is that if he did, 
we are often not prepared to handle God-sized answers all at once. It was important for the people to clearly understand the heinousness of their unfaithfulness to God. So, in response to the cries of his people, first the Lord sent a prophet to warn them. God was reminding his people how he had powerfully provided for them in the past specifically when Israel was miraculously rescued from harsh slavery in Egypt. Even when we as believers are straying from him, God reminds us of his goodness in an effort to bring us back to him. Verse 9 says, I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians. And I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors, I drove them out before you and gave you their land. The prophet began by reminding the Israelites of what God had done for them, while they suffered greatly as slaves in Egypt for over 400 years. God also reminded his people that he delivered them from their enemies who oppressed them. Even drove their enemies out of the land of Canaan and gave it to his people. Their past victories in conquering the land were not accomplished in their own strength. The sovereign Lord was the one who had driven the enemies out. Here is an analogy to our lives as believers today. Our progress in the Christian life is not due to our own strength. It is God who has, and still is defeating our spiritual enemies, and we must look to him if we are going to continue making spiritual progress. Verse 10 says, Said to you, I am the Lord your God, do not worship the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. The God who saved them demanded they worship him alone, not other false gods, like the gods of the Amorites who were living in the land. The Israelites worshipped those gods because they wanted the good those idols could supposedly give. They also wanted to avoid the bad their neighbors said those deities would bring, if ignored. This is not panic or terror, but a sense of awe, respect, and obedience. They respected the power and whims of gods that were not gods at all, while ignoring the power of the one, true God, Yahweh. Despite all he had done for them, the Lord said, through the prophet, his people themselves were the cause of all their troubles because they refused to obey him. Verse 11 says, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in offer that belonged to Joash, the Abbey's right, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. An angel, typically referring to a pre-incarnate form of God the Son, in scriptures, comes and sits under an oak tree at a place called Afra. The tree belonged to a man named Joash, the Abbey's right. Near the tree, Joash's son is threshing wheat. This process involves crushing the harvested stalks to separate grain from inedible parts, with the help of an animal. The results will be sorted, later, in the process of winnowing. This is much easier in a large, flat, open space, called a threshing floor. Yet Gideon is working in an inconvenient, crowded place, a wine press. He's hiding there to keep the food hidden from Midianite raiders. Israel's only hope to hold on to any of their crops at all, was to keep them hidden from the marauders from the east. Verse 12 says, When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. The angel of the Lord, who seems to have an entirely ordinary appearance, now shows himself to Gideon and offers a strange greeting, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. In the Old Testament, mighty warriors, include David, generals like Naaman, or soldiers. Now that grand description is applied to a man doing a servant's work as quietly as possible, hoping not to have his food stolen by an enemy. But God was not mocking Gideon, he was preparing him for a great work, and he wanted Gideon to get a glimpse of what God's presence could do for him. The Lord was preparing him to be Israel's deliverer, although Gideon didn't realize it. Like many other of God's people past and present, Gideon had leadership ability that he would only realize as he demonstrated faith in the Lord's presence and claimed his strength. Hearing God's words of assurance, 
was Gideon's first step to becoming a mighty man of valor. We should be grateful that God sees us not only as we are, but also as we can become by his strength. This should encourage us as well. Verse 13 says, Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. At this point, Gideon didn't recognize who his divine visitor was because the only thing that was on his mind was Israel's situation. He didn't even notice the greeting that the Lord had promised to be with him. He incorrectly assumed that the angel was saying that the Lord's presence was with Israel so he asked, if the Lord was really with Israel, he wanted to know why had all this misery happened to them. It was hard for Gideon to believe that the Lord was with them when they were suffering raids and being terrorized. In addition, Gideon knew his nation's history and he believed his forefathers' accounts of how the Lord had delivered them from Egypt through miraculous deeds. But he was perplexed, and wanted to know where all those miracles were now. Gideon was not questioning God's power, he was questioning his presence. Or why has the Lord forsaken, and delivered them into the hands of the Midianites? However, Gideon was wrong when he concluded that the Lord hath forsaken us, because the truth was Israel had forsaken God. In times of adversity, our first inclination should be to question ourselves, not God. Verse 14 says, The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Gideon responded to the angel's announcement, that the Lord was with him, with bitter skepticism. The Lord seems to ignore both Gideon's skepticism and his question. He simply tells Gideon to go. Once again, the angel implies that Gideon is a powerful man, despite finding him hiding his food from raiders. When God is with someone, that person is mighty. Still, there is an irony in the way Gideon's observation about Israel's plight which was followed by a command from the Lord to go and fix it with the power of the Lord. Complaining to God about what's broken sometimes results in being recruited by God to take on responsibility for making the situation right. Gideon was reminded that it was the Lord who was sending him and giving him the assurance that God's presence was with him in what he was about to do. The truth is that if God calls us, he will also equip us like he did Gideon. Verse 15 says, Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Gideon no longer doubted that the Lord would deliver Israel, but he doubted his own ability to lead such a huge undertaking. Our common reply to God's calling is we are not capable. Gideon lists all the reasons he shouldn't be thought of as a mighty man. His clan is the least influential of his tribe, and he's not even the most important person in his own family. That lowly status is highlighted by the fact that he's doing a servant's job, despite not being a servant himself. Gideon can't imagine he has the power to make a difference, that anyone would listen to anything he had to say about saving Israel. Bravery is not a lack of fear, but the strength to overcome fear to act. By that standard, this timid, self-doubting Israelite is legitimately one of scripture's bravest heroes. Our final verse says the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. God didn't rebuke Gideon for his objection. Instead, he nurtured his weak faith with a promise saying, Surely I will be with you, and you will defeat the Midianites as easy as it would be to defeat one man with one blow. Previously, the Lord had assured Gideon that he was sending him, now he promised to go with him on his mission. And where the presence of the Lord is, his power is also there. To Gideon, this must have sounded incredible, for the number of Midianites was staggering. 
Judges 6 5 says, they came as grasshoppers and could not be counted. The kind of victory the Lord described could be achieved only by divine power. The Call of Gideon God's choice of a deliverer was a man who thought little of himself, reluctant to believe that God had the right man when he approached him to lead Israel against Midian. As we look around in our churches we may not see many wise, mighty, or noble people. We may not even see many accomplished or very important people. But the truth is that God often calls common, ordinary people. He isn't interested in using proud people who will take credit for what he has done. The Lord often calls humble, faithful people who will serve him. All calls involve simple faith and obedience to the Lord. It is true that Gideon didn't have great faith, but he did have faith. The Lord nurtured that faith step by step, until Gideon was willing to step out and lead just 300 men to a great victory over a massive Midianite army. The Call of Gideon 1. Rest assured, doing evil before the Lord has its consequences, Judges 6 1-2. Sin corrupts a person's relationship with God, sin separates man from God. 2. When in trouble, try remembering what God has previously done for encouragement today, Judges 6 7-9. Remembering God is motivating and encouraging us to move forward in faith, following God's leading, obeying His word. 3. We will live in fear whenever we are disobedient to God, Judges 6:10. God's rules are given to protect us, when we disobey, we are against him. 4. God will reveal himself to us in the midst of hardship, Judges 6 12 In fact we have hardship and trials because only then can we understand that at the end of our weakness is his limitless power and love. 5. Even when it seems that God has forsaken us, he has a plan for our deliverance, Judges 6 13-14 No matter what you may be facing today, trust in God's assurance that everything will fall into place in His perfect time. 6. Fulfilling God's will is not limited by our financial status or social class, Judges 6 15 The Bible says we are created for God's pleasure, what makes us to be fulfilled is doing the will no matter how difficult. 7. God will reassure us that He is with us, Judges 6.16. As long as we have confidence in God, He will respond to our prayers, and enjoy the hope of eternal salvation. We are truly glad you spent time to learn this lesson with us. We hope you are blessed and may share these with somebody else. Thank you very much, have a great week, and God bless you always, dear brothers and sisters.